I read a little bit last night because I couldn't sleep, so I was reading a little bit. And I was interested to hear that you started out in um, working with marginalized groups. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that because when we talk about community and transition, that's something I'm curious about. So, mm -hmm. how did that? How do you feel that that work might have influenced the work we do now? Huh. I think I've always been drawn to. Um, people who don't fit wherever they are <laughs> um, and and people who are authentic and it may sound strange but I find often people who are marginalized in various ways and in that context that was primarily drug misusers and uh, young asylum seekers so sort of 15 16 year olds who'd arrived in the country with with nobody else um, and people with uh, mental health difficulties of various kinds. Um, they're often not, they, they're marginalised because they don't play the game or fit in and often that's because there's something more more genuine going on um, and maybe it's very difficult for them. Um, but that was what, what drew me there was the sense that I actually, I find it much easier being in an environment with people who are authentically difficult than people who are um, falsely easy. <laughs> And uh, and that work I, I really loved, um, sort of helping people to who sort of I, w I ended up managing a learning centre, um, so helping people who'd not got on with mainstream education for one reason or another to identify what they what they actually wanted or needed to learn, um, and maybe they needed some qualification to go in a particular direction they wanted to go in, um, and tailoring something quite individual for them. Um, and it was it was a really it was a really beautiful work, um, but I think what pulled me away from that in the end was a sense of um, I suppose my own personal awakening to the um, the global crises in particular at the time climate change and and sort of energy crisis peak oil type concerns uh, and feeling like my work was to some extent I suppose I framed it to myself as helping people to reintegrate with society to the extent that they wanted to and I started to think well wh why am I helping people reintegrate with society if society itself is running off a cliff <laughs> um, and uh, and so increasingly in my in my sort of spare time I was learning about these these wider crises and feeling sort of drawn towards that as, as the area that I wanted to engage with um, and then when a, a sort of natural point came at which I could sort of step away from that work. I could have continued, but it felt like an optional uh, break point. Um, I decided to step away from that and not really knowing what I was stepping towards, um, in truth. I mean, I was, uh, I think, about 25 then. Um, and when I talked to people, I didn't really have any peer group around these kind of concerns. It was stuff I'd sort of researched on my own on the internet and stuff like this. And, um, and I found that People would say, oh, maybe you should go and work with Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth or something. I sort of looked into what they were doing. That didn't really feel feel right. So what I ended up doing was learning how to live very cheaply so that I didn't have to worry so much about making money. Um, and that freed me up to spend what ended up being about a year just reading and going to events and uh, harassing people who seemed like they knew what they were talking about. And uh, and eventually led me to, to Schumacher College in 2006. Uh, to a course called Life After Oil, uh, and there I met people like Satish, uh, Rob Hopkins, who was just sort of just beginning on the transition journey, um, David Fleming, who became my sort of mentor and, and close friend, uh, Michael Meacher, many people. In fact, I think there were I think there were around twenty eight of us doing the the week long course, uh, and maybe ten of those are still really active part of my life now, sort of eight years on. Um, so it was suddenly. I remember Peter Littman, who's the chair of Transition Network, I met there. I remember he saying to me, you have the air about you of a man who's been wandering in a desert and has found an oasis. And uh, that was how it felt. It was like, wow, an actual peer group of other people who were engaging with these issues and exploring what we could do about it. Um, so that was sort of my my transition from, from there to here. And I suppose also the uh, learning about living a, a much less... Um, financially dependent life, um, a much lower financial consumption 
um, led quite naturally into the work I've been doing around sort of moneylessness and the gift economy later as well, although that took a while. I'm uh, part of a thriving transition town, mm. uh, Media, Pennsylvania. Um, and I think one of the questions we struggle with is just how to be more inclusive and mm -hmm. how to uh, hear more voices. I know your interest is more around three soil and, and, and climate per se, but community resilience ties into all those, those things as well. Mm. So what do you think? I mean, how important is it for us to try to find a way to bring others in to the, to the movement at this point? Yeah, I mean, I would say my interest is, is more in community resilience than in peak oil and climate these days, actually. I find that once you've nailed down the, the kind of big picture, um, lose to some extent the interest in following every minute detail of how these things are, are, are progressing and maybe look more at what you can do about it. Um, I suppose the big change of perspective that I think is really essential, um, well, two maybe that I think are really essential for transition, engaging with that, I think it has been a something transition's been very aware of as a challenge from the outset is that you know it, it it has part of the magic of transition is that it does reach beyond the usual suspects in some ways in that um certainly here in the uk we find that you know um members of the sort of more right-wing conservative party will come along conservative council members and um maybe the local council are keen to engage so it's not just sort of um uh, and sort of environmentalist uh, niche but as you say there are, it, it, it has struggled to reach out to certain areas and i think one of the mental shifts we need to make is to stop asking you know, how do we engage these people and instead ask those people what we can do to help them so rather than how do we get them to come to our meetings maybe we go to their meetings maybe we say to them so what what are you struggling with you know, what are you trying to get people engaged with um, and then at that point, you know, often we go, oh, well, that really ties in. I mean, there was a lovely transition Kingston in southwest London um, I co-founded and was very involved with for a long time. I'm not living in Kingston anymore, but um, still very much in touch. And we started a project called the Cambridge Road Estate Diggers, which was working with um, one of the poorest estates in London, which is just on the edge of um, Kingston. And in fact, it was the highest crime rate postcode in, in the whole of London. Um, and we started meeting with their residents association and that was instigated by them. They approached us and said we'd really love to start growing some food in some of these green spaces on our estate that aren't really used but we don't really have the skills to know how to coordinate that and maybe you do. We said great, you know, we've got a lot of members who know a lot about that stuff. Went along, um, there was a lovely moment where uh, some of our group were saying so who, who is it within the council or whoever that we need to ask for permission for turning these green areas into growing spaces and the residents just laughed at us and said they don't care what we do here <laughs> you know we can we can dig up these green areas you know the police never come onto our estate the council never come here you know why would we ask permission and it's quite a lovely um sense of ownership that they have over their space you know in a, in, in quite a quite a quite a different way to maybe what a lot of transitioners say Yolanda are you there yeah. come on in I'm sorry I didn't mean to leave you hanging yeah, until you grow it and then they come and tell you to rip it out. Right? <laughs> well, no, actually. That's good. Um, they do that by us <laughs> in Oakland. No, so, um, so we started the, the growing project, but then there was a problem that, um, and we were quite pleased that, you know, none of the residents were in any way sort of disrupting it or vandalizing it or having any problem. There was a sort of curiosity. But then the idea was that the food would be given to residents of the estate. Um, but we found that nobody was really taking it um, and the residents association who we were working with asked around and found that they didn't really know what to do with that kind of food you know it's more used to going to the supermarket and buying packaged food um, and so then the residents association organized cooking classes using the ingredients that we'd grown um, offering free cookery classes and people got to take home the food they made and keep it that suddenly became really popular and then we managed to sort of crack that engagement and so again it came back very much to them approaching us with a need that they had and us being able to meet that rather than us saying you know how do we get them interested in climate change or peak oil or community resilience or however we might frame things that's awesome yeah i like that a lot we have a food bank and all our farmers are involved it's really mm. really nice and um, sometimes they come up with vegetables no one knows how to cook right yeah. we have to bring little recipe cards <laughs> like this um tell me what dark optimism means mm. yeah dark optimism is a, a widely misunderstood thing I seem to get a lot of people coming up to me saying 
Are you feeling dark today or optimistic? And it's like, yeah, that's not, that's not quite what I mean. Um, I think it means being um, unashamedly positive about the kind of world we could create, but unashamedly realistic about how far we are from doing that right now. So not uh, sort of bright, shiny optimism, which I can find quite frustrating. Because you're like, well, everything isn't fine, actually, you know? Um, a sort of uh, an ability to look at the more difficult aspects of, of, of where we are and what we're doing, um, whilst also retaining this sort of deep um, faith in, in human potential and, and also drawing on, you know, the deeper questions of, of why we're really here and, you know, does the, does the state of the world in any way um, challenge our, our purpose in being here or make that impossible and I don't think it does even if even if we are into a world of, of unstoppable runaway climate change for example there's still love to do there's still positive change to make in the world and I think um, dark optimism is, is is remembering that whilst not not denying how how much suffering and difficulty there is Thank you. Um, you're familiar, familiar with dark mountain mm, very much yeah. mm. can you tell me how if you relate to that at all or? Yeah, well, I was quite involved with Dark Mountain from the outset. Um, I mean, obviously, they, they, they stole my darkness <laughs> in their name. Um, but that, that's from a, a Jeffers poem, The Dark Mountain, originally. And, um, uh, yeah, Paul Kingsnorth and Dougald Hine are good friends of mine. Um, and, in fact, Dark Mountain's been quite a, quite a significant part in, in my own journey. Uh, I went to the first uh, Dark Mountain uh, festival, I think was the phrase they used, Uncivilization. Um, and I was there to talk about how the sort of emerging Dark Mountain themes um, interact with transition and how the two kind of relate to each other. Uh, and while I was there, I met uh, Mark Boyle, who's known as the Moneyless Man, uh, and he was there talking about his book, uh, The Moneyless Man. Um, and we immediately clicked, um, sort of became best friends, and I've been working with him very closely over the last few years. Um, so Dark Mountain is both, I think, uh, you know, an incredibly important part of, of um, enabling us to ask the questions that we're often not allowed to ask. Um, you know, maybe it is all too late, and if it is, what does that mean? And, and you know, maybe this problem isn't solvable. And I think there's a, there's a sort of um, a logical flaw at the heart of a lot of arguments that we make in the sort of broader, I don't know, the movement, whichever movement label you want to put on it. Um, which is that we tend to look at things and say, well, that won't work, so we need this. So, you know, well, example um, might be people saying, well, renewable energy can't ramp up fast enough to solve our energy crisis, so we need nuclear. Or um, the mainstream parties aren't going to give us what we need, so we need the Green Party, or so we need not to vote, or so we need whatever. And the thing about that is that the premises and the conclusion don't join up. You might just as well say, renewable energy can't ramp up fast enough to deal with our energy crisis, so we need sardines. You know, or, or the mainstream parties aren't doing anything, so we need sardines. You've not said anything about the alternative. You've just said, this doesn't work, so that. Um, and I think Dark Mountain kind of addresses that to an extent. It's like we're saying, oh, well, um, you know, the, the argument we hear again and again in environmentalism is, you know, do, should we be working for radical change, you know, fundamental shifts, or should we be just working within the existing paradigms? And people are saying, well, you know, we, we don't have time to wait for a revolution, everything has to happen now, so we've got to work within the existing paradigms. And then other people saying, well, you know, if, if we don't have a radical fundamental revolution, then what's the point? Because we're just addressing symptoms and we're not just... And both of those arguments, I think, are completely valid. And yet you hear people arguing back and forth and back and forth about this and never finding resolution. And I think the reason is because they can't admit that they're actually both right. Actually, there isn't time for radical change and we need radical change. And so if you can never accept that actually maybe they're both right and we have to ask some really deeper questions about, wait a second, what does that mean? Then you just end up with people over here having a nice career saying this and people over here having a nice career saying that and never actually getting to the, the deeper truth. And for me, Dark Mountain is a, a venue where we can ask those kind of questions. Well, what if this doesn't work and this doesn't work and we don't actually know of an alternative? And can we actually sit with that? And can we actually sit with that together? And Can we have a conversation about what that means? Um, and to me, that's, that's a really potent and fertile um, space. Mm -hmm. 
I do that sometimes. It's kind of fun in its way. <laughs> Stop in focus. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think what that says to me is that there's a place for sorrow in optimism mm. that I don't often see in, in a lot of the talk about how lovely things mm. will be and should be. Um, so do, do you agree with that? I mean, is that sorrow something you carry? And can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, I mean, part of part of my uh, my journey over the last few years is that um, David Fleming, who was my sort of uh, mentor and very close friend, passed away very suddenly at the end of 2010. Um, and actually, we were just a few weeks away from from launching a big thing that we'd co-authored. Um, so it was a very difficult and busy time to try and hold that, deal with the work that he was going to be doing on that as well, and you know bring it through to the fruition we were both hoping for, whilst also trying to process the grief of, of the sudden loss of my my good friend and then actually just uh, three weeks after he passed my my fiance passed away very suddenly as well um, and so that was a profoundly challenging time um, and I'm quite happy with how I how I moved through that and I got those things done and then kind of came to a point of, of having the space to um, grieve a little more uh, and that's, I don't think grief is a process that ends, I think it's a, a relationship that, that, that continues throughout your life. Um, but I've sort of found over the past few years that when I've been reflecting on and, and writing about my personal grief, um, there's a very strong correlation between that and the grief that many of us carry, maybe all of us carry, for the, the state of the world and, and the state of nature and the state of our society. And, and I think grieving, as opposed to loss, is a process of opening ourselves, that when, when we suffer uh, a loss that's overwhelming, we shut down because we're overwhelmed in the same way that you don't feel all the pain of a, of a mortal injury. Your body just says, that's too much pain, I'm going to shut it down. We shut that down and we shut down part of ourselves and that keeps us from being completely overwhelmed but it also keeps us from being fully alive. And the process of grieving is the process of, of coming back to life. And I think that our, on a personal level that's, that's very true, but I think on a societal level, on a collective level, that's true as well. And I think that part of the reason that we fail collectively currently to face up to the kind of damage that we're doing in the world is because the grief of it is so overwhelming that the process of opening those doors again is incredibly difficult because every one of those doors was slammed shut because behind it was a huge overwhelming bunch of pain. So every time that you open one of them again, there it is waiting for you and you have to have the space to do that, um, to, to, to work through that pain. Um, and it's only by doing that that you come back to life and you start to be able to respond to these problems in a way that is more sort of open and allows you to look at it all in the round and say, okay, what is the most appropriate way of acting here? Rather than the sort of, oh God, I can't look at that, I can't look at that, so I'm just going to get on with this, I'm going to keep my head down and work really hard at this thing because I can't look at the bigger questions because, because the grief is still there. Um, and so I think increasingly uh, the you know, as a, as a sort of writer, I find I'm sort of writing all the time about whatever's going on in me and the, the writing that I've been doing more recently that seems to have touched the most people um, and in a way that feels most powerful has been around this, this, this relationship between grief and despair and, and creating a space where we can um, open that out. And obviously there are other amazing people doing that work as well. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it seems like grief is a process and despair mm. is sort of dead end, you know? It's well, there's a, there's a really interesting thing about despair, I think, which is that it has a spark in it of deep motivation. I think despair can be described as looking at every possible scenario and seeing no hopeful one. But what that means is that if you can present to someone in despair one scenario that looks hopeful, that looks like a real possibility, there's this immense wealth of motivation to drive towards it, because despair is not a nice place to be. So if you can actually present someone with something that's a possibility, even if it's just a narrow possibility, then despair becomes this huge drive, this huge motivation that can achieve incredible things. Mm. Mm. That's, 
lighten up a little bit. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Let's stop this there. <laughs> Oh, they're the best ones. <laughs> um, let's just go really large. Why did you come? <laughs> it's been doing. Uh, to some extent, to, to listen more than to offer. Um, I mean, I'm, I, Findon, it's, I've been invited here many times over the years and have always, for one reason or another, not made it, often due to being quite busy. Uh, and to some extent, I think I came because a number of the things I've been working on have sort of fallen through lately. Um, and so, you know, I've come uh, bringing the gift of those, those failures which have opened up space um, in my life. And, you know, I'm sort of quite actively looking at the moment for the, the people, projects and places that maybe are going to form the core of the next chapter in my, my story. Um, and this seemed like a really, a really beautiful place to do that. Um, and, uh, and also, I guess, the, the theme of the New Story Summit, I mean, that really is the the overarching theme that's run through all my work. I mean, my, um, my book, The Transition Timeline, was very much about trying to create this, this transition vision um, and a sort of fourth, fourth story of, of how the future can pan out. And I think there are probably still three really dominant stories in our, in our culture about, about the future. And I think one is sort of business as usual, that you know, everything will basically carry on as it is and little things change, but nothing really fundamentally changes. And, you know, if the graph of whatever you're looking at looked like that for the last 30 years, it'll look like that for the next 30 years. And that's how so much government and business planning is done. And it's a really powerful story. And another one is doom, you know, of one flavor or another, whether it's Terminator or whether it's Age of Stupid or, or you know, in some way we're going get to our, get our comeuppance or religious apocalypse or whatever it might be. And again, we see that throughout our, our culture, in our stories, in our films, in our plays. And the other would be a sort of um, techno utopia. Um, you know, your Star Trek, like the, our manifest destiny is to be off exploring the stars and we're this incredible, ingenious species that's just this sort of uh, the myth of progress, as I like to call it, that we're just continuing on along this path towards our glorious future. And I think all three of those are in all of us because they're in our culture and they're fundamental to our culture and probably we all draw on all three of those at different times in different contexts in our lives um, and it's really easy to see why the uh, the sort of techno utopia future is is the most compelling of those it's the most positive of those um, and I think that's why an awful lot of the people who are trying to uh, work for change in society are, are trying to work towards that because it's the compelling narrative I'd much rather live in a future that's beautiful techno utopia than one that's that's business as usual or one that's doom. Um, but I think one of the things that that transition and our wider movement does is try and flesh out firstly the problem with that techno utopia vision which is that it's actually not realistic that there are all sorts of things that tell us that 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 sort of agenda is 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 running up against the buffers and running into all kinds of intrinsic problems. Um, and so what we need is a is a realistic positive story to set alongside that. Um, and I think in all the diverse manifestations of all the people who are here for the next week, um, that's what that's what this is about, and that's really what what all of my work's been about. So, yeah, it felt like a very fertile place to be at this point in my life. I think it's interesting um, all these diverse um, perspectives, you know, coming in and just being able to talk to different people, you know, mm. and, and hearing different different things. So, I guess um, that's what I'm really wondering is if the sort of consciousness you know, people uh, living the earth, living the universe, and the people focused more on, you know, climate and practical change at the community level and engagement, civic engagement, um, if, if it can all kind of fit together and, you know, come to light somehow. I mean, do you think, do you think it's a movement that needs to be organized? Do you think it's just completely self-organized? Ideizing, or what, yeah, what, do you, what do you think? Where, where are we going with it? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Yeah, I mean, we could ask where we're going with it as a movement or, or as, a, as a planet, you know, equally. I think it's an interesting question. I, uh, is the right question, what do we need? Or is the right question, what are we doing? I'm not quite sure. Um, I mean, I suppose I do have a um, faith. I guess is the is probably the right word um, that 
to answer that question, we have to ask some deeper questions, which is, you know, what are we collectively or individually doing here? You know, what is the point of existing? You know, what is it all about? Because you can't ask, you know, do we need to organize or, or should we just trust our instincts? Or unless you know that that, that question requires, do we need this in order to what? <laughs> and you know, if, if everything, like I suppose the dominant story in our secular society is that it's all meaningless, you know, we just exist for a while and then we die and then we sink back into nothingness. And if that's the case, well, then there are no needs. There's nothing, you know, it doesn't matter what we do, we just do it and then we die and that's the end of the story, right? Um, I think for me, the, um, the best way I've found yet of, of framing what on earth I'm doing here is telling a story that on my deathbed I would be proud to tell, honestly. Um, and that will look totally different for everybody. You know, everyone's got different things that they want to express or, or, or embody in their lives. Um, so that, for me, is the first question, is what is the, the deep story that we're, that we're here to tell as individuals and then collectively? Um, and not just necessarily a singular story. Uh, there's a, an arch druid actually called John Michael Greer, um, who's a brilliant writer, and he once wrote, it actually came to him in a dream, I think, but he, he wrote, uh, knowing many stories is wisdom. Knowing no stories is ignorance. Knowing one story is death. And I think we have to be very careful that we're not trying to create the story here. We're trying to create a story um, because it's, if you look at proverbs, for example, and stories of cultural wisdom, they often seem to contradict each other. You know, you look at um, you know, many hands make light work, too many cooks spoil the broth. And you think, well, how many people should I get for my broth making? You know? um, but actually, there's a wisdom in that, that you've got, you've got stories that you have to use some discernment in yourself to decide which of these applies here, right? But they both hold true principles, but you have to apply them with some skill. Um, we don't want sort of automatons who, you know, imbibe the stories like, uh, like a computer program and then just go out and live them out. It's all, about, it's all about personal wisdom and responsibility and discernment. And so I think that as we create a diversity of stories here, hopefully some of those, or maybe all of those, will be about the deeper questions of, of what are we all about. And then only when we've answered those for ourselves or, or collectively, we'll be able to say, what do we need? You know, if all, if all that we are trying to do here is um, reach personal enlightenment, for example, then what we need to do is might be go and meditate in a cave and have nothing to do with the, the state of the world more widely. Um, if what we're trying to do is, is avert uh, runaway climate change, then there's a whole different set of things that we need. Um, and I think we will all have our own answers to that question. Uh, but some of those answers will involve an awful lot of collaboration. And then once we know who we're collaborating with, what we're trying to do, then we can decide what kind of organization we might need. I guess that's the fourth story. <laughs> yes. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. And um, I mean, it's very, very interesting. I've been uh, sort of asking a few people, like, how is this summit going to be organized? You know, what is the agenda of how we're going to do it? And uh, the answer that seemed to come back from numerous angles has been, well, yeah, it's kind of up to you. We're creating a space, we're holding a space, and then you know, you're know you going to come in and you're going to create within that. Um, maybe that's not a bad analogy for the, for the world as a whole. It's a space for us to come into and, and, and create what we need within that. And uh, yeah, we shall see what emerges. Okay, okay. We probably only have one or two questions left. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, Do as long, long as you like. No hurry. Oh, great. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yolanda, do you have something you'd like to... Yes, maybe you can give some recommendations for other young change makers. Oh. Like, because you have, seem to have a lot of experience. So what do you have to say to other people who also want to do something like this? Yeah, I'm going to talk to me, as though I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> well, what advice would you give to young Yolanda? <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, I, I, I gave a talk recently um, at an event uh, run by a group called the Brahma Kumaris, who have a centre called the uh, World Spiritual University in London. Uh, and the event was for 16 to 35 year olds who wanted to engage with these kind of um, environmental issues, I suppose. And uh, I think one of the 
one of the big themes that came out in that was that a lot of the questions that were asked were sort of um, what led you to sort of become an activist and the, the sort of underlying assumption was you know okay so I'm here living this sort of fundamentally selfish consumerist life sitting on my couch watching this stuff um, so what led you to have this miraculous transformation into this selfless activist who's going out there trying to make the world a better place and I think that framing is a big part of the problem that actually for me becoming whatever I am whether that's an activist or, or whatever um, was about selfishness really um, it was about the perspective which which I hold that um, in a very real and important sense we're, we're all one um, and that our well-being is is completely interdependent and that from that sort of spiritual perspective the suffering of others and the suffering of the world is my suffering um, consequently you know sitting on the sofa watching TV selfishly consuming wasn't very selfish because it, it, it didn't satisfy me it left me with this 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 sort of pain at what was happening um, and this discomfort and I, oh, I feel like I should do something about that but I don't know what it is and it was really uncomfortable for me as an individual um, and the thing the only thing I think that could make me more comfortable was to feel like I was facing up to these challenges trying to engage with them in some some impactful positive way um, and that was the only way that I as an individual could feel happier and, and, and more content and more whole um, and so yes that process of uh, opening to the, the pain that we feel at the state of the world, the anger or, or dissatisfaction or sense of injustice or whatever it might be that we feel when we look at how things are. Um, if we don't try and face what we feel about that and, and hear the call that it might give to us, then we're shutting ourselves down, then we're becoming less alive. Um, and I think probably the one uh, piece of advice that I would give to, to young people looking at it is to remember that you cannot not change the world. Whatever you do will change the world. If you take the most default option, you follow the most mainstream, down the line, just keep your head down and get on with what they tell you to do approach, then that's the world that you're helping to create. There is no way you can not change the world. And so open yourself to everything that you feel about the state of the world. Don't let anyone tell you what to do, but just ask yourself, how do I want to respond to this in a way that isn't shutting me down, that is opening me up, that is helping me be fully who I am? And that will lead you for the rest of your life because you're unlikely to finish, uh, finish whatever work that leads you to. <laughs> In our kind of mainstream culture that you know financial independence is a good thing you know you shouldn't be dependent on other people and it's you should be really proud if you're financially independent financially self-sufficient and it's a myth I think because the, there's no such thing as as financially independent like if you have enough money to buy everything you need fine but then that food that you bought in the supermarket or wherever was still grown by someone else, it was still delivered by someone else, it was still the whole infrastructure of getting it to you came from someone else. So it's not that you're independent, it's just that you're dependent on people you don't know and that you don't have to get on with and that you can replace by, by giving your money to someone else. Um, and I think within the uh, sort of green movement we've got our own version of that, um, that myth which is this idea of self-sufficiency. You know, that as, a, as, a, as an individual, as a community, we want to be self-sufficient. I'm growing all my own food, I'm, I'm off-grid for electricity, you know, I'm self-sufficient. And it's really the same myth, because you're still dependent, you know, that all that, all that equipment, all the skills you've learned, all the everything that you do is completely dependent on, A, other people, but also, obviously, on, on the wider ecology. Um, and so, yeah, self-sufficiency, I think, is the green movement's version of the financial independence myth. And um, we do need to come into this sense of interdependence. Right. Yeah, um, I'm bumping up against that a little bit. Um, you know, my teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, certainly oh, okay. um, encourages the community to be uh, peaceful and strong. And mm. but, but then, you know, that's sort of, the, then there's the next step, which is now to engage, you know, in other ways. And mm. so what I'm struggling with really is the civic engagement piece. You know, in mm. other words, we, we're doing that and that's all, 
well and good, but like you say, it's it's really just sort of more. It's too much about us. Mm. You know, now how do we take that energy that we've created, created a community, mm. and now how do we actually start to make things change, maybe at more policy levels, or right. other communities? What is it? You know, what's yeah. the next step? Well, uh, I have a pertinent question <laughs> um, and a quote actually from my from my late mentor David Fleming. I think the most brilliant thing he ever said was that large scale problems do not require large scale solutions. They require small scale solutions within a large scale framework. And I think very often what we need to be doing is creating those frameworks. So not trying to say, well, you know, here's climate change and I'm going to solve it because you know you've missed the point, but we can create frameworks that, in, uh, that encourage and stimulate and support the various small-scale diverse solutions that are required. So, you know, at one point in my life, being really concerned about climate change, I thought, oh, what I need to do is go and get involved in the United Nations process, because that's where they're trying to set a cap on emissions, that's where, you know, the real action's happening, that's where we've got to cap it at the global level. But then sort of realised, well, even if we did, and it doesn't look like we are, but even if we did get a, a a cap at the international level that was in line with the latest climate science, it would mean absolutely nothing if local lives didn't change. We'd just have a cap set up there, everyone would carry on living the same way at the local level, which is where everybody lives, and the emissions would, would continue and there wouldn't be any, any connection between the two. So then I started thinking, well, what's the framework that can connect this up here with that down there? which is why I spend a lot of my time working on this uh, framework called Tradable Energy Quotas, or, or TECs, TEQs, um, which is a sort of method of, of taking those caps uh, and dividing them into quotas down at the individual level. Um, and it provides a, a framework for local individuals and communities to be able to um, work together um, to create the new ways of living that make it possible to live in a, in a low carbon way. Because the, the real challenge with climate change is not setting an adequate cap on, cap on emissions. That's essential and necessary, but it's not sufficient. And the real challenge is going to be creating a society that can thrive within that cap. Otherwise the cap will become politically, well it will be abandoned because people will say, well, you know, I don't care about your future generations, my kids are hungry, right? Um, and so I think those kind of frameworks are where we can put our energy. You know, the local level can become incredibly frustrating because, you know, for example, a transition group, uh, Kingston, where I'm from, we might reduce our petrol use by 50%, say, great. But under our current economic and social frameworks, all that would do is bring the price down a bit, which would encourage a bit more consumption somewhere else. And you know, you think, well, what's the point? And it sucks all the energy out of all that great local work because you think, well, what's the point? You know, we're not changing anything. So there is the need for that engagement at the higher level, but we mustn't just think, oh, we need large-scale solutions. What we need is large-scale frameworks for small-scale solutions that harness and encourage them so that all those sort of individual teardrops, if you like, can be harnessed into a wave of change that's actually sufficient to, to engage with the problem. And, and I suppose that's been the theme of my work over the last few years, has been where are those frameworks? So similarly on the land rights side, um, you know, one thing that transition groups certainly in the UK often run up against is the lack of availability of land and lots of the classic transition activities are ways of dealing with that, whether it's land share where, you know, someone's got a bit of land which they don't have time to look after and someone else has the time but doesn't have the land and they kind of enter into a partnership for, or whether it's, um, you know, communities working with uh, local farmers to try and, you know, change their growing. These are all great things, really valuable things, but again, they're ways of working around the fact that as communities we don't have access to the land that we, that we live on. Um, and so one of the things that I'm involved with at the moment is a group called the Ecological Land Cooperative, which I, which I chair now. And the approach there is to uh, raise community finance to buy land that's currently in, in industrial farming use um, and uh, seek planning permission, working with a, an amazing bunch of experts we have on low impact planning policy in this country, um, to seek planning permission to build dwellings on that land so that it can be turned into small scale agroecological um, growing. And uh, we bought our first piece of land back in 2009 and eventually on appeal we won our 
um, one planning permission for dwellings on that and we've now got growers on the ground doing small scale agroecology and also partnering with universities who want to use this as a study so this land has been in this usage we're turning it into agricultural usage and showing the difference in productivity the difference in emissions from that land hopefully sequestering of carbon and actually measuring all these things because again that kind of research provides a framework that then supports the great diversity of people because i think the in many ways what the what the world needs most at the moment is people who actually are in place you know not not um, you know, think as an activist jetting around the world trying to change problems at a large scale, but actually people who are just in love with a piece of land and growing there and, and dealing with that in an ecologically healthy way. But again, those aren't necessarily the people, the people who can be that grower aren't necessarily the people who can talk the language of the planning system or who have the money to buy the land. And so again, it's about putting into place the frameworks like the land cooperative, which can help those people who are perfectly suited to a particular part of the solution to access that um, and so we act as a sort of intermediary between the planning system and the growers um, and also by running most of our um, activities on a sort of gift economy basis so a lot of us are working unpaid to, to make this happen it allows us to offer the land much more cheaply which means that people who don't have the money to buy a holding um, to do this kind of thing but very much want to live that lifestyle are able to do so uh, and so again it's this this wider thing of you know just working on the small scale solutions can feel quite disheartening when you see the bigger picture. Just working on the bigger picture can be totally disconnected from where the, the systems need to be. But if you're working to put in place the frameworks that support the small scale work, then you can sort of top up your energy and your enthusiasm by going and spending time at the actual project that's happening on the ground, but also knowing that you're, that you're working at a larger scale to make that possible and support it. And I think that, for me anyway, at the moment feels like um, a nourishing way of engaging with that that endless debate about you know what do we do what level do we operate at all right one last question <laughs> <laughs> um you said you, you know you're not sure what's next for you you're, you're kind of thinking just without even thinking about it what do you want what is it that you want to do next what's next without even thinking about it my answer seems to be that it's to do with the the spiritual um that that seems to be more and more where my my heart is led and more and more where what I work on sort of seems to resonate with people. Um, and it is asking those, those deeper questions about you know, what's it all about, why are we here? Is it all made worthless by the fact that we're losing so badly on so many fronts? Um, but then I've always found that when I, when I go and meditate or I go and I'm still with myself, that's, that's essential, that sort of listening and receiving phase. But then quite quickly I get to the point where, where I sort of get, get told um, by whatever energy that is, that it's, you know, you've got to apply it. Because if you, if you know something and you don't do it, then you don't really know it. Um, and so it's that reflection on what's fundamental for all of us. And then whatever I'm doing in the world is, is, a, is a direct outflowing of that. Uh, and as yet, I don't quite know what that looks like, but I'm here to uh, continue the investigation. <laughs>